bright enough? Yeah, really. Greetings, Guardians. Welcome to our panel at EGX. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm Deej from Bungie, and what we're going to be talking to you about today is how we built the worlds that you explore in Destiny 2. Uh, I've had the pleasure of uh, coming here to the UK with three of the people that I work with at Bungie. Uh, and if we can put our presentation up on the screen, uh, I will introduce you to them. Uh, we're going to be talking about building better worlds, and as we introduce the people on our panel, uh, everyone I've met today has had impeccable manners, but this is your opportunity to make some noise and to welcome them to the stage, beginning with Steve Cotton. You want me to say something? Yeah, go ahead. Hi, guys. How you doing? Everybody good? So talk to us about what it means to be a world design director at Bungie. All right. So, uh, well, I get to direct the team at Bungie that works on all the worlds, all the activities in the worlds, campaigns, strikes, raids, the open world, lost sectors, adventures. Uh, and then I get to hand these guys problems, and they get to solve them. And then also, let's say hello to Jesse Van Dyke. Hey, everybody. How's it going? So um, my role uh, is very much uh, one where I work together with Steve and Jason to make sure that, uh, I mean, first and foremost, the game looks pretty, but uh, it, more importantly, is also fun to play, right? Um, this is a thing that we, we spend a lot of time on, not necessarily making sure that we, we get the most out of it aesthetically what we want, but we actually make sure that players understand what kind of visual information we're feeding them. But that means making sure that you, know, you can see your opponents in the crucible, that you know where to go if you're exploring a destination, those kinds of problems. That is, in a nutshell, what I do all day. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, our world art lead, Jason Sussman. Uh, so my job is to take everything that comes out of their heads and try to make it a reality and put it into the game. So that's building the geometry, putting down all the rocks and pebbles and grass and everything that you see, uh, and building that in the environment. So now that Destiny 2 is out in the wild and open for exploration, we've created a place that we hope inspires friendship. But all of those places begin with an idea, and they're driven by art, and they're driven by imagination, and then we build those places. So what we'd like to do for the next 45 minutes or so is peel back the curtain and show you behind the scenes and talk to you about how we create a, a space where you go in and become the main character, to create these worlds that house you and your friends as you become heroes, as you become legend, we're going to start with Homecoming, which is the first mission in Destiny. Uh, if you played the beta or if you've begun your story campaign, uh, this is a mission that you should be familiar with. I will warn you right now that throughout the course of this panel discussion, we will be talking about all of the explorations, or most of the explorations, in the Destiny story. So if you haven't finished and you don't want anything spoiled for you, there's the door. <laughs> but if you want to learn all about the different worlds that we've built and what's gone into it, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're also going to leave some time at the end for questions. So as they tell you their stories about building your stories, think about what else you might like to ask these gentlemen about their unique contribution to what is Destiny 2. So Steve, we're going to start with Homecoming. Talk to us about the purpose. Talk to us about the function that you wanted this first mission to serve as part of the overall player experience. Uh, all right. So, uh, yeah, the, like Dee said, uh, every, everything in Destiny, the experiences, the worlds, all start usually with a simple idea. And a lot of times that's just one word or one simple phrase. 
Uh, and for this one, uh, it's not going to surprise anyone, I don't think, but it was about loss, about losing your home. That's what homecoming was all about. Uh, but it was a little bit more complicated in that, than that. This was the first mission of a sequel, and we needed it to do a lot of things. And so that's what I get to do, is put to get together that list of all of those things it needs to do, and then hand it to these guys. And so it needed to, it needed to bring in new players. It needed to introduce the world of destiny. It needed to introduce the city, and the traveler, and the vanguard, right? But it needed, for old players, it needed to act as a trip down memory lane. We wanted you to see Zavala in action, defending people of the city. We wanted you to see Ikora doing anything, any, everything that she could to protect the speaker and the traveler. We wanted to see Cade doing Cade stuff, you know? Uh, and so it needed to do all of those things, but in the end, you needed to meet Gaul and meet the Red Legion. And it needed to set up in your head the difference between being all powerful and losing everything. And so we take that problem and then we put it, we put it over here. Yeah, and so uh, what we'll do next is we'll show you guys a bunch of like the, the designs that went into uh, uh, creating the first mission. And like Steve said, this was very much the place where we had to do a bunch of like pretty fundamental visual storytelling. Like we had to establish the main antagonist, right? Which meant that we had to figure out what Gaul looks like and how he is different in many ways than the Cabal, um, or the other Cabal rather. Uh, and it also like, presented us with a bunch of practical problems like what is his ship and and how do we design his ship in such a way that uh, you know it's clear that this is something else altogether this guy is in a in a in a different of a different caliber of of antagonists basically and as we do these things you'll see sketches like these where we explore the macro shape but also uh, start thinking about some of the smaller problems and the the, the the picture you see here in the lower left corner is actually one of the first explorations uh, into the drop pods, which is one of our uh, spawning mechanisms in Homecoming. I believe we have some more pictures of that, and this is a continuation of that process. This is the kind of thing that we do a lot of, where we just figure out, like, hey, what is the best way to communicate to players that uh, there's a bunch of new dudes coming in? How can we do that in a, in a, in a way that is not only clear, but it's also visually satisfying? How does it, how does it basically... Uh, elaborate on the story that we're already telling about the Red Guard, about these ruthless guys that, uh, you know, have a very brute force approach to almost every problem. Um, and this is actually a great segue into something that Jason can speak to more elaborately. This is, this is a great example of a before and after image. What you're looking at here is a concept for the, uh, um, the, the ship that we're showing you in, in Homecoming. And we spend a lot of time figuring out like how the best way uh, for, is for us to like bring this over into the game and if we go to the next slide you'll actually see that this is what it looks like in the end game and and it's it is a pretty close match to the concept yeah and while the concepts are happening we're actually building those spaces in gray model and trying to understand what the gameplay is going to be uh, and how those encounter pockets are going to work out and some of those concepts will actually be painted over the top of our existing geometry as it's going through iterations and then we'll finally get a postcard shot like the one you saw that will result in this so uh, another another important like let's say story element in the first mission that we have to explain to people is the fact that the 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 the, the most important thing on Gaul's mind is the traveler. He wants to be uh, given the honor of of the light. He he wants that as a gift. He doesn't want to take it for himself. And so um, the sort of the material representation of that desire is the cage, as we sort of call it, the, the thing that he built around a traveler. And it's actually a fairly elaborate machine. Um, we, we start off the game with showing you this thing in a cinematic where it flies towards the traveler. Um, initially, like we deliberately leave it a little bit sort of uh, ambiguous as to what the purpose of this thing is and, and, and what it is actually here to do, but fairly soon you'll see that its intentions are in fact not benign at all. If we go through the next couple of slides, you'll see what the, the process looks like that took us there. So this is a, this is a series of uh, illustrations by uh, the, the concept artist that worked on this for a long time, Dorje Belbrook. And he really sort of figured out almost every minute detail of the, the specifics of this contraption, I'll call it. Um, and it starts off with something that, you know, sort of semi-plausibly can, can make its way through space. 
um, unfolds, uh, attaches itself to the traveler, almost like a, a leech of some kind, a giant mechanical leech. And um, from there on, it basically just spreads like a, it's almost like a disease. This thing that initially begins out small, but it becomes bigger and bigger. And over time, it basically uh, covers the entire traveler. And this is important because while it is, uh, it's, it's certainly not the main visual theme of the homecoming mission, it is one of the most important narrative beats. It, it, it supports the idea that Gaul is so preoccupied with the traveler. Um, not, all, not least because this is also, again, spoiler warning, where uh, the, the, the campaign comes to an end. It concludes with, um, you know, this machine playing an important role. So we did give you a spoiler warning. When you fight all the way through that first mission, at the end you get kicked off the back of Gaul's ship. You're sent limping back out into the wild to discover new ways to fight, to become powerful all over again in some new and exciting ways. And along the way, that brings us to the new social space that you'll find in Destiny 2, which we call the farm. Yeah, so the farm uh, is, is, you know, it's the first place you go to after you've lost your power. Uh, so the theme here is, is about, like, the last stand. It's about a rebel base. Uh, we actually uh, referenced Hoth a lot in here, minus the snow. Uh, and so we wanted it to have that feel. Um, we also wanted it to be sort of a juxtaposition between the organization of the Guardians in the tower and humanity that's been scattered out into the wilderness. Uh, this right here, I think, shows um, the, other, the other considerations that we make when we're designing these spaces. This was going to be your first social space of the game. And uh, it's really important in the social spaces that vendors are not too far away from each other, that, that you, it's, they're easy to find, and that one leads to another, and the views are good. And, and all of those considerations uh, come into play when, once the artists get a hold of it and start concepting it. Yeah, and so this is, these are pictures that come from a phase where uh, you know, people like Jason and I will work very closely with the concept artist to, to basically develop a very early version of the space itself in tandem with uh, further visual explorations in concept. It will, do, it will allow us to do things like, hey, what kind of uh, 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 visual themes do we want here? And, and not have to worry so much about like, but how far apart are the vendors actually? Things like that tend to have a great impact on, you know, the, the sort of the degree to which you enjoy being in the space. If you have to walk forever to get from A to B, it's just boring. Um, and so we'll do this while Jason and his team figures out the specifics of like, hey, where am I, where, where, where are we gonna put which vendor, for example? Yeah, and uh, being a social space, it was also another area that uh, had a lot of iteration, and we were consistently checking in with each other and making sure that it met the goals of what the, not only the direction uh, that we're being giving visually, but also thematically. And so we do things like we make sure that the shard is aligned. We make sure that you know the composition of your opening shot when you land there tells you everything you need to know about that space. You know that you're going to be going to the shard. You can see your vendors, and it tells a nice little story. So you make your way from the farm, and you can see the Shard of the Traveler in the distance, and very early on they tell you that is a place you must go. Of course, they tell you that by saying, that's a place we don't go. And in your gamer imagination, you think, well, I should go there then, right? Because I want to go shoot things, so I'm going to go to the place of danger. And the European dead zone is really the first place where you take your first steps to become a hero again. So Steve, what were our intentions in creating this first frontier that they explore? So uh, the European dead zone uh, is the first place you get to go that's not just a mission, right? That's not a single, like a single line uh, experience. Uh, this is when destiny really starts to be destiny. Uh, and we actually spent a lot of time trying to get it right, the amount of time players spent before they got here because it was so important this moment when you get out into the EDZ and you start getting exposed to all the new activities that we got to put in the game. So the, the European Dead Zone really captures the essence of having all those different activities, having lost sectors, having adventures, uh, having public events and a public event loop. Uh, we spent a lot of time trying to really cat, like, get right how much messaging we did on the map for players to understand where they could go. Uh, we have several pillars that we're working from when we're working on Destiny 2. One was uh, human relatable, making the spaces relatable to everyone. Uh, another one was easy to find the fun. 
And I think that's where EDZ really started to shine. It's like the map, how it functions, how much stuff is on there, and how easy it is to get to the thing that you want to be doing at that time. Uh, from an art perspective, do you want to say something? <laughs> from an art perspective, uh, it was nature ascendant over man. That's really the, the, the general art concept that we were running with. And so we wanted it to capture that. And this concept looks amazing, but this is also a, a sort of a, this speaks to how we, we develop the look over time. And this concept was one of the early ones and we sort of went, we sort of like it evolved. And I think Jesse can speak to how it did. Yeah, just like we want the fun to be easy to find, we also want the, the, the visual themes uh, uh, that we put in, uh, in things like a destination to be easy to understand. And so when we work on things like figure out what the shard should look like, we typically go through a bunch of like variants before we settle on the final form. And this is an example that we felt, while it was nice, it was a little bit overcomplicated, it was hard to understand what was going on. So if we go to the next slide, we get a much simpler proposition, one that we like better because it's clear. Like, it, 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 it's, it, it seems more plausible that you would call this a shard, for example. And that's really important to us. Like, those, those single word descriptions of things that we put into, the, into this fantastic world, we find often work the best because they're just easier to convey to players. Um, yeah, and like Steve said, nature ascended over man was the theme here, um, and that means that you know we we can go out of our way to sort of build this space that has has a bunch of has an interesting cocktail of emotions associated with it. It's it's sort of semi uh, you know melodramatic, like it, it it you you're constantly confronted with the the notion that you've lost all of this uh, you know this 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 beautiful. Uh, you know, this, this beautiful pocket of human civilization in a, in a beautiful natural terrain and still pretty, like we, we make a very clear effort to make sure that our, our destinations always feel welcoming. Um, but it's also a very strong testament to the fact that like a lot of things went really wrong in the collapse. Um, and yeah, this is another uh, this is another early version of what the town should look like. Where you know we're not concerned about things that I alluded to before, things like travel times and and, and actual uh, uh, you know like the, the the scale of places that you get to go to. And so this proposes a much larger town that we that we built initially. But it was like was just it took forever to get from A to B. And so we we very purposefully are 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 completely willing to abandon concepts like this for the sake of the enjoyability of the game. So it isn't long that we've spent on EDZ before we inherit uh intercept a message from Zavala and Zavala says come to Titan. And there are people in the EDZ who say stay home, fight with us here, help the survivors here, but you're explorers. You're heroes. So you fling yourself back out to the stars and you visit a place called Titan. Steve, what did you intend for them to find when they first arrived in this oceanic world? Uh, well, the first thing I'm going to say to this is that when, when you have, when you have a, a team as big as ours, I think it's really important that you're able to kind of condense the, the theme and the idea that you want to convey down to something simple, like I was talking about before. And so the, the theme for, for Titan was Lost Utopia. Uh, and that can be translated in a, in a number of different ways. And so that's why it's important then to start doing concepts and get those out in front of the team so they know what they're building. But what we wanted is we wanted, uh, we wanted it to feel like Zavala needed to go out. He needed to go out into a place that he believed he could rebuild the fleet. And where would he go except this lost utopia that has all the resources and the things that he needs uh, to, to make it happen? Uh, but of course he didn't expect the hive to be there and to be deep down in the recesses of this place. And so another word that we wanted to use a lot was claustrophobia, like building these tight spaces where the, where the hive could, could, could be threatening. And, uh, and again, those, those, those couple key words are what we usually start the building process with. And just, Jesse's just going to look at this concept uh, <laughs> admirably. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. This is this is another interesting example of like a picture that certainly captures all the the, the ingredients of the space, but actually looks fairly different from what we ended up doing. Um, and that's not that's not bad. Like we we put these images together with the intent of getting all on the same page, where we say, okay, so basically what we're doing, we're telling this story about these incredibly uh, uh, sort of elaborate and and sophisticated structures that humanity's built that you see in the background there. Um, 
but then uh, we also have uh, a whole bunch of like floating construction equipment that is simply there because when the collapse happened, these things weren't completed yet. They were, let's say, 80% complete. And, and the construction is, equipment is actually the thing that uh, Zvala can now leverage for his, his war goals of, of building a fleet to recapture the city with. Um, and so this is where you see sort of the uh, the final in-game version of it. Uh, it's interesting. The the, the 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 there's there's varying different thoughts behind the uh, the platforms. Like they they are a very good natural containment for us, which made the the pitch to do them much easier. Right? It it, it allows us to, to 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 say, well, this is where it can go, and it it doesn't doesn't force us to do things like soft kill volumes where you get like turn back messages and stuff, stuff we, that we typically are not a fan of. Jason, talk to us about when you get the tools into your hands and you actually start building these places, is it a matter of the concept team handing art off to you and then you going and building that or do you go back and forth with the concept artists throughout that process? It's a, it's a circular discuss, uh, discussion between all parties, design, fiction, uh, world art, and concept. And we're, we're all talking to each other and iterating and coming up with ideas. I mean, what, the other thing that was really intriguing about Fleet it was an opportunity, because it's on water and there's things like at these odd angles. If it's methane. It, yeah, it, yeah, that's right, methane. Uh, it, it's at these odd angles and it ends up, uh, you know, having a sense of unease when you're fighting the hive. And there's, there's a lot of opportunities that kept coming up and that was through those discussions. Titan is one of my favorite destinations in the game because it sends you to so many different places. You talked about claustrophobia, and we've got this juxtaposition here of this beautiful golden age city and the light shining in through the, through the roof. It's almost like the, the alignment between heaven and hell because then you send us down into the depths and it's corrupted by the hive and it's twisted and infested. Uh, what was it like to play with those different design palettes to create such different moods in the same destination? Well, I think you hit the nail on the head. Like we, we very chose for a very blunt contrast between something that was very simple, very sophisticated, very devoid of a lot of surface detail, and, and this is what the architectural palette for the the utopia ended up uh, being. Uh, in contrast with the very dense, very like noisy hive structures that were, uh, you know, uh, very sort of organic in shape and, and, and were different in almost every conceivable way from the, the, the human environment. Like, we, we deliberately sought for those themes to clash really harshly in the places where they, they uh, came together uh, at the same time. And from a world art perspective, it's actually, it's nice to be able to have two things you toggle between. So you do this really nice, beautiful, utopian, overgrown, uh, location, and then you jump right into the hive, which is just this disgusting thing, which Kevin, you know, did a great job finishing that out. Jason, do you ever have bad dreams after spending hours and hours in the darkness just putting calcified fragments all over the wall? No. No, you just no I love it. That's you, great. You have nerves of steel. <laughs> So then we journey further out into space, arriving at Nessus. Uh, Steve, talk to us about what we wanted to accomplish with this world. Uh, okay, so well, well, I mean, you like Titan. I, my favorite uh, destination in, in Destiny 2 is Nessus. Uh, and, there's, and there's a reason for that, because I think it has a really cool story, its origin story. Um, and I don't mean a story in the game, I mean a development story. Uh, so. Both Jesse and I, uh, who's, who's played the Vault of Glass in here? Yeah? Yeah, Raiders. Right. So Jesse and I got to work. We were lucky enough to work on the Vault of Glass. And, and the thing that I, I was always really uh, uh, fond of in the Vault of Glass is how it played with players' expectations. Uh, we, were, we could do things. We were doing things there that I didn't think we had done before. Now we've done a lot of them since. Uh, verticality, lots of adventures, mazes, puzzles, environmental puzzles, that kind of stuff. Uh, and Jason came to me on the team and he's like, hey, I, I want to make a whole destination like Vault of Glass. Can I do that? And uh, I thought it sounded awesome. So De Nessus started from that nugget of inspiration and, and, it, and it turned into uh, the planet that it is now where Kate gets to go and have a clever plan. And it kind of makes sense because it's a place where things kind of like puzzle, there's puzzles to solve and things like that. So. It seemed like a really nice fit, and uh, yeah, Jason's really passionate about it, so he should talk about it now. 
Well, uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed working on this destination and um, worked with a guy, uh, Dan Miller and uh, Matt Beignet in the early days of this. And this is one of the examples of us going through that iterative process. And we knew we wanted to have verticality in this concept. I believe you, this is your concept um, where we're trying to just kind of go through that process in a 2D uh, setting before we start building it. We were, we were massing some things out, but we were trying to figure that out. And we quickly moved away from this because it was uh, Chris Barrett saw um, a painting. I'm trying to think of the... John Harris. Yeah, John Harris painting. And uh, it immediately started gravitating towards this look. And so then we got this concept, which I believe was done by Sung, or was that Dorje? Dorje Bellbrook. Dorje. And... Um, this is when everyone really started identifying with what the, the destination was going to look like. And we were taking it even further and saying, like, let's take this destination and make it just fully terraformed by the VEX. Like, what would that look like on a, on a grand scale? And again, playing with the verticality you can see in this concept. And so we started talking about the, the landing zone. And from the get-go, I always wanted the landing zone to be like you're jumping into the vault of glass, like you're just descending into this destination. And so this is a concept of, of what that would look like. And so this is in-game, and this is looking into... Um, now I'm trying to think of the, the final name of this, this area, because I still have... We have names that we call things early on. Uh, I think it was originally called Lava Flows. Anybody remember the name? Anybody remember the name of this bubble? Lava flows. No, it's not lava flows. That's the I funny think, thing. I think, yeah, I think, I think we ended up everything. calling this a cistern. Is it a cistern? Yes, yeah, yeah. cistern. Yeah. Okay. And so we had an opportunity to uh, bring in a hazard, a player hazard that you hadn't seen before, tell a little bit, little bit uh, more history about the Vex, or at least allude to it. Um, and yeah, so it's kind of the planet like breaking apart, and you're seeing all the, uh, I, don't, I can't call it Vex milk. What's it called? Radiolarian fluid. Radiolarian. There we go. There he is. Yeah. Now you know. We never call that Vex milk internally. Yeah, never. Um, and so, again, verticality. You know, this is going into the strike. Um, and so this is where we're still. We, we just want to kind of evoke those aspects of the, of the raid and vault of glass as much as possible as far as navigation. So then uh, early on, Jesse and Rob Adams started talking about verticality uh, with using vegetation. And we always wanted to take vegetation to another level and really just see wh where we could push it. And so Jesse started uh, this concept pass um, trying to explore that a little bit while we were still massing some things out. If you go to the next slide, uh, once we kind of identified we wanted to do uh, these giant roots and trees and things you started to, that you'd be running on and playing on, uh, Sung was taking an example, and you can probably speak to this too, was, it was saying, well, what does that look like um, to scale? Like, how would, that, how would that look? Yeah, it's interesting. The, the, the choice for us to make red trees is one that we didn't take very lightly. Like, we, we actually, when we build our destinations, we have a very deliberate goal, which is to not put something in front of you that is unfamiliar to you in every way. And so our base assumption when we build things like Alien Worlds is always that we need to have a good explanation for why trees aren't green. Like, there's a reason why trees aren't green, and that doesn't mean that we can't deviate from it, but it is, it's, it's, very, it's very easy to, uh, you know, like, put so much strange things in a world that it just becomes a little off-putting, and, and as we call it, unrelatable. That's not what we want. We want there to be familiar elements. And so um, when, we, when we were talking about the, the trees on Nessus, uh, and, and we were, were thinking of ways to... Um, you know, make them clearly alien trees. We settled on their uh, their size and their color as being their sort of defining strange characteristics. But in in other ways, they actually behave fairly similar to trees we have on Earth, and that's very deliberate. Yeah, and so you know, not, not to mention getting the color palette and everything to be pleasing to the player. They want to be there. And uh, Jesse did this final concept that nailed it for everyone. It hit the atmosphere, hit some lighting, the trees, everything was right there for us. And I, I know that Jesse really wanted to evoke a place where he could wade into the waters and, and have a nice beverage, a nice cocktail. And uh, it was very inviting. So now what you're seeing is uh, the actual in-game um, reality of, of what we end up building. So at this point in the campaign, you have reunited with Zavala. You've gone and you've liberated Cade from his dangerous experiment. There's one more vanguard that you need to get the band back together. 
and you can find her on IO. Yeah, so IO uh, is the first time that we've taken you near Jupiter. Uh, and IO, the theme that we talked about here was looking for answers. Uh, not just you as a player looking for answers at this point in the campaign, but Ikora is looking for answers. Even the Red Legion is present on this planet. They're looking for something as well. Uh, and so the mystery with IO was that the traveler had been here, had, had, there was some traveler light left, and, uh, and that was the source of the mystery and the source of the answers that you were going to find. Um, yeah, and that's, that's basically where this started. And so uh, Jesse went to town trying to make it look like IO. Yeah, it was super fun. Like we 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 spent a lot of time figuring out like how can we how can we you know create a, a visual that is immediately identifiable as a screenshot. This is a test we put in front of ourselves fairly often, where we do a thought experiment when we work on stuff and say, hey, if if 12 months from now I Google for this thing in Google Image Search and I see a single image among a hundred different ones, will I be able to identify it? And so for us, the the choice. To, to lean into the yellow sulfur that actually is present on, on IO was a very, very sort of careful decision and, and ended up, you know, giving this, this destination a very distinct, uh, you know, visual characteristic. Um, yeah, this is another example of like the juxtaposition of the, 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 the more relatable overworld where, you know, you have a lot of like geological statements that we make. Uh, and in that in contrast to the stuff that happens underground, which is just like total like on steroids, crazy vex contraptions, such as the one you see here. And the final sort of in-game uh, representation of that. And yeah, it was a ton of, ton of fun to work on these. Jason, talk to us about working with the vex design palette and uh, kind of all the rules that you get to break, because we would never build a structure like that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I actually worked on Black Garden in uh, Destiny 1 as well, and the Vex architecture is a really, it's a fun one to do, and it's, it's, you can do crazy stuff like this. And a lot of times, like, we make these really bold statements with the architecture, and this is like Matt Benier early on, a lot of the stuff that he put in, even in the earliest gray model of what this space would look like, stayed. And, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. And then uh, you talked about not wanting to show the player anything that would be completely unfamiliar. There's a lot of things that we get to play with. We get to see the Vex portals. We get to see uh, you know, the verticality from the Vault of Glass. There's always that sense of danger. There's always that sense that you might fall. Anything could jump out of those gates at any moment in time. Yeah, absolutely. This is an example where we where we obviously lean into the Vex palette super heavily, but we were very, uh, you know, very deliberate of, about the fact that sort of in the middle of all this crazy alien architecture, we have a, we have a focal point that we identify very clearly, right? The, the place where the boss Brachion first spawns is, 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 is a visual beat that we can't afford to not be crystal clear. So even, even though like when you first land here, you're surrounded by all this alien architecture, like it will immediately be obvious to everybody that that is a place, the, the center of this ring is, is much more significant than all the other places in this area. So the themes of Destiny 2 are coupled between loss, which Steve talked about at the beginning with Homecoming, but also of recovery. Uh, as the heroes of this story, you're able to recapture our home. You're able to regain your power. And once that story is over, we are able to return to the last safe city. We are able to look at the tower that was destroyed and take up a new place that we can use as the center of our power and the hub that will govern the end game. So Steve, talk to us about reimagining that experience of looking out over the city as the heroes that protect it. I'm la I think you just said everything I wanted to say. Uh, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. Uh, so yeah, what, no, what do you said? Um, we knew we wanted you to end you in the city. I mean, that was the whole point, to get your home back, to defeat Gaul, and, uh, and have that place that you lost uh, uh, there for you. Um, but it, it wasn't, it, we wanted it to feel different. We wanted the world to have changed in some way uh, forever. Um, so obviously, uh, we wanted the Traveler to look different at the end. Um, but we also wanted the tower itself to be different. And we'd actually talked about bringing you and, and having you be in the tower, the actual tower that you, you knew before, uh, we had talked about that for a long time, and it just didn't have, it didn't feel, you didn't feel the weight of the impact to the universe enough. And so 
um, it was more important that you saw the, the old tower that was destroyed, and you could see it in the skybox right there. Uh, they still hadn't finished rebuilding it, and so you're left to exist in a different, in a, in a new place, in a different place. Um, and symbolically, we also wanted the vanguard to to be separated, uh, to be scattered, just like they were during the campaign. I mean, they've come back together, but they're not the same. Uh, and so it's it's not a coincidence that Ikora is in the boulevard and Zavala is out on the in the main deck and that Cade is in the hangar. Uh, and so, you know, things are not going to be the same anymore. And we wanted you guys to, to, to really uh, feel that. Jason, this is a, a view of destiny that we very rarely share. Talk to us about this phase in the process. Talk to us about what we can see here because we're usually not this naked about our creative process. Yeah, this is actually Jesse taking some architecture early, early, early phases of architecture, which is a destination level mass out, which is, we're just trying to understand the basic forms of what we may want to build here. And Jesse taking that and really driving home the co composition of what this is supposed to be. It's, it's really like, I mean, Steve hit the nail on the head. Once we had figured out like, hey, in order to like to, to, to come up with a with a good ending to the campaign, we need to put players on this on this sort of perimeter outside of the city rather than in the in a tower. The the amount of exploration we had to do in concept was was absolutely minimal. And so basically what what I was able to do is pretty much take Steve Direct's message and 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 share it with Jason and then sitting down with these guys and say, hey, this is really what we should do. And it, and if, and it was almost self-evident from that point onward that it was clear to us that we should have the tower in the distance and it should be destroyed, right? And that while you have all the same facilities to your, that are, are available to you, like the, you are clearly uh, in a different place and, and like you're a level below the tower that you were once in. Yeah, we wanted to make sure that you're looking back at your past, right? And this is, this is actually one of my favorite environments to work on. I worked with Brandon uh, Campbell and Mark Thompson on this and it was, it was really good because we had a lot of back and forth. There was just a lot of iteration, a lot of discussions uh, of like laying the foundation of like, okay, what's it like to be on the wall? What's it like? I mean, what is the actual industrial side of what this is? And then how would they build this up and build upon it and make it, again, making it appealing for the player, but also, you know, fictionally relevant to what they would do and, and, and where these, where the different um, guardians would be. Like, where would Zavala be? Where are all these people going to be located in the tower? And then building around that. So Destiny is all about the, what you can contribute. Uh, Destiny is all about you adding your voice to the experience. So at this point, what we'd like to do is welcome you to ask questions. And the important part of this is we have a very rare opportunity to talk to people that build the worlds that you explore. So please ask them a question based on what they just talked about. Give them a chance to elaborate on what they do at Bungie. I'm going to pass the microphone off. Uh, if we ask a question that isn't ideally suited for them, I'll answer it which means you'll get a bad answer, <laughs> which essentially means you've, been wa you've wasted your chance to ask a good question. So let's try to keep it on them. Let's keep the focus on them. What do you want to know? Hi. Um, one of the things that I really like about I.O. is all the bones and shells and things that are lying around. Um, what was the kind of mythology thinking behind that? And um, did you ever think about having real creatures still existing in that space? Absolutely. Yes, we absolutely thought about that. And then you will, you will notice that there's a very distinct absence of detail in things like our lore tabs that, that pertain to this particular aspect. And that's very much on purpose, so I'm certainly not going to ruin anything here. Um, we are very yeah, particular about like giving you things that evoke more questions than they answer. And the bones on IO is certainly a crystal clear example of just one of those things. So sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you anyway. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you for making Destiny. It's the first game I've ever played where I've made real life friends. So thank you very much for that. Thank you for playing. <laughs> You're welcome. So, the big question, what was the most challenging thing about making Destiny 2 different to the first Destiny? 
I'll, I'll, take, uh, I'll take that one. Um, uh, well, we were doing a lot of new things with the way the activities uh, were, were fitted around the world, right? Like keeping players in the world longer, getting rid of the orbit, which I'm sure everybody's probably happy about. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so that was pretty challenging, actually, because we, we didn't have that stood up for a long time. We didn't know what that was going to feel like. And to be honest, making Destiny's hard in that way for a lot of reasons, because until you get online with everybody in this room, you really don't know how the game is feeling. We know in our gut how we want it to feel. But uh, I think the most difficult thing for, for me, anyway, was knowing whether that was going to work, the map, uh, finding stuff. Uh, and then actually having players be on the world l for a long time and having that feel good. Right. Thank you very much. <clears throat> hey, guys. Hey. Same again. Thanks for Destiny. It's been an incredible experience all these years. Thanks, guys. Um, so my question is, um, with regards to science, and uh, obviously you guys, you guys really sort of uh, you, you, you break boundaries with science uh, in Destiny. So. Uh, the planets you go to, they all have gravity, and, and you know, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot. You're talking about red trees and things like that. Where, creatively, where do you draw the line with science? I think that we draw the line at the same spot where uh, we would draw it if we were talking about uh, an aesthetic that we care deeply about. The line is always drawn at the point where things are fun or not fun, right? And so it doesn't really matter whether or not something just looks amazing or is scientifically accurate. Like, as long as it's not fun to play, it is probably not good for us to put it in the game, right? And so science is often a starting point for conversations with us, but, but we very purposefully never let it constrain us. And so uh, I think the methane oceans on uh, uh, Titan are a good example. Like. They could theoretically never exist in a place where people walk around because of like pressure and temperature, but we are kind of hand wavy about that and, and, and throw words like space magic at one another when someone is being particularly difficult about things like that. So yeah, I think the razor is where things, things, sh things should always be fun more than anything else. We can explain away any scientific discrepancy with hashtag space magic. Warlock Master Race. <laughs> Slightly shorter than that fella. Hi guys, um, again, thank you for making Destiny, sharing your passion, it's very evident in the game, so once again, massive thank you. Uh, my question is just a very simple one. What did you feel were the main lessons from a gameplay and from a design standpoint that you learnt in the first iteration of Destiny, you know, including, inclusive of, you know, the extra um, expansions, so. I mean, I could talk about it from a world art perspective, yeah, some, of the, yeah. some of the stuff that we did, um, finding places or finding nooks and crannies was really fun, and it was even surprising to us, uh, and even for myself, because some of the destinations in D1 I hadn't even seen until the game, basically the game shipped. And I would go through Cosmo and go to other areas, and I didn't know I could get there through this path, and it was trying to recreate those, and, and I think lost sectors, that became kind of a thing. You know, we had kind of like smaller caves in D1, but it's like, how do we expand upon that and give that player that moment of discovery? And so uh, that would be one for me. One lesson learned. There, there was many, but that's Yeah, there, were, there was a lot. I think we learned a lot over a lot, three years about Destiny 1. Um, for me, I mean, it was, I think I've said it before, the goal was to try to get people together more in the world. Uh, and really take something that we thought we did okay in Destiny 1, like public events, and, and take those and, and put those in front of people in a different way that makes them better. Yeah, they, they definitely feel richer, the worlds that you explore in Destiny 2 as opposed to Destiny 1. Uh, so that's Thank credit, you. To, credit to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. The smallest person. Um, so the area that Icora first shows is on Io, the holy place. What is it? Is it like a crater? Are the, is the, the planet energy reaching towards where the traveler was? Or was humanity building up towards to kind of, like, is it a cradle? Was it supposed to hold the traveler? I think Jesse knows what that is, but I don't think he's going to tell you. Oh, please. <laughs> well, uh, I, I can give you something that, like Mikey just started, if you, if you pay close attention to uh, the, the cinematic that we call the dream cinematic, which happens as you get tossed off of Gaul's ship, 
There's a fragment of this particular location in there, and if you pay close attention to it, you'll actually see that it changes during the, the three second window of time that you see it. Um, which, which, and that, and, and the, the, the thing that changes about it, and it's very subtle, mind you, it's not something like super obvious, uh, is, is a sort of a, a slight hint as to why it looks the way it does and, and, and what role it plays in the game. And, and somewhat disappointingly, that's where I'm going to stop talking about it. Spoilers foreshadowing. Uh, Again, no comments. No comment. <laughs> wank, wonk. Thank you very much. Hi. So I'm meeting some of my clan for the very first time this weekend. Um, we met through the LFG. Uh, we've become good friends. And basically, none of us would know each other at all if it wasn't for Thorn. Um, and I've just seen somebody walking around cosplaying today with a Thorn model. Um, it, basically, these people are now a huge part of my life because of something that doesn't really exist. So is there any point during production where you guys create something and then look at it and go, wow, people are really going to connect to this? It's going to really enrich their lives? I think, I, I mean, it, it happens all the time. I mean, there, before the game, before D2 came out, there was weapons in our game that I'm like, I'm gonna, I need to commission someone to make these for me because I want them on a shelf. And I mean, yeah, there's, just, there's certain weapons that you automatically identify with that you just, it's just cool. I mean, it's like really, really, our armor, right? Um, which I won't be able to commission. Yeah, and I, I, think, I think the, 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 same, the same experience that you describe is one that like we have all had too. And, and I don't think it's limited to just weapons alone. I think it, is, it pertains to a lot of components of our game, like the, the destinations themselves, these, these virtual places that don't actually exist that all of a sudden have become the place that I hang out with with my friends. I think, I certainly, if I can certainly speak for myself, that took me by surprise. Like when we shipped D1, I was surprised at how long I kept playing the game because, you know, like all of us, like we, 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 we play the game at home and, and of course you do that because you spend so much time working on it, you poured so much love and energy into it. Of course you want to see that, you want to experience that firsthand on your couch and we all do that. But the, the interesting thing is that we all kept playing after our sort of, you know, obligatory playthrough of the game was complete and, and we still do that and like we still raid together and yeah, that's, well, we've we, we, we gone through the same thing. Yeah, we discuss internally. We're constantly like, oh, did you, did you get this? Did you get that? And we're talking about different aspects of the game um, that are definitely, everyone has their favorite, right? We have a lot of people in the studio, and every ha everybody has kind of like their set of things that are their favorite part of the game. Yeah, and we well. look for cheese spots on Reddit, you know, like how can we, how can we <laughs> like, weasel our way out of this raid encounter? And a quick question from the clan as well, and this is ridiculous, but it was, it was democratically decided, so I have to ask, do you guys like custard? Custard? Yeah. Sure. I do. Sounds great. No. Are you do you no? have some? No, I like custard. I like custard. <laughs> Boo. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> Hello there. Um, the Traveler is obviously visually present for the most amount of time of anything in the game. Um, I'd just like to know what kind of iterations you went through in its original design and what challenges it presented visually. So, as I, as I said before, like, there, there are components of our game that, like, you know, we, we are deliberately vague about, or, or not necessarily vague, but we are very particular about the kinds of information that we give you. Probably none more so than the Traveler itself. It is, it is a super important icon to us. Uh, we, we, we very carefully, you know, created more holes in its narrative than we actually give you narrative itself. Um, and so what I'll say is that the, the image that was part of this presentation where you see it sort of more fractured than it was before is, is the result of a long process, uh, one that involved many more uh, concepts that would have completely derailed the campaign had we included them in the game ultimately. And uh, yeah, again, like I can't speak to the specifics, right, for, very, for the reason I just gave you, but... Um, uh, yeah, like we 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 very much enjoy the process of seeing you know fans come up with their own theories as to why that is, and and it's obviously also for us important, like from a future facing perspective. Like we we want to make sure that we we you know continue to tell interesting stories about the traveler. It's a it's a crucial component of our of our game. You'd be surprised how long it takes to draw a ball. 
<laughs> it's, right. it is a lot, yeah, there's a lot that goes in. I mean, yeah, these guys spent a long time trying to get it right. Thank you. Hey, guys. Um, basically, what's the process of choosing the planets for each uh, game? And have you ever designed the planets with different enemies in mind? So say, like, the, ne uh, the hive on Nessus, was that ever a concept? Or is the enemy types chosen before you actually go into the design process? So every destination kind of has a little bit of a different story to it, the way it was developed. But uh, for the most part, um, we kind of have a story that we want to tell, and we know where we want to take you. Uh, and so in this case, all the destinations kind of fit into that, into that paradigm, except for like Nessus, for example, was something that sort of came more out of a challenge to ourselves about building a, a different type of place. And then it fit in the story really nicely. Um, it also, we, we do definitely take into account what, what the combatants that we want to have there are. I mean, uh, and so uh, usually there's two, sometimes three different ones on a planet, and, uh, and we, want, we want each planet to feel unique, not in terms of just the environment, but also in terms of the combatant diversity. Yeah. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Deej, your yep. warlock is trash. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> And with that, we're going to end the panel. So <laughs> you, can, you can thank that gentleman right there for killing what was a beautiful moment for the rest of us. Uh, please remain seated, because before we go, um, first of all, we're doing a signing uh, over in the Destiny space. Uh, we're going to be there at uh, 4 o'clock this afternoon. Uh, so if you want to come over, if you didn't get a chance to ask a question, I'm so sorry, but perhaps you can meet these gentlemen and tell them what was on your mind. So we're going to be in that space, stop by and get a poster signed. Before we go, we would like to take a selfie with every single one of you. So gentlemen, stand up and follow me. We might want to bring uh, lights up on the house. There we go. Thank you so much. All right, guys, come over here and get next to me. There we go. Looking good. Hang on. Line up, line up a little bit more. Here we go. Thank you so much for playing our game. Thank you so much for waiting for as long as you did to get into this room to be with us today. From the people in the front row all the way to the people who stood up in the back, it has been our pleasure to be here with you today and to make a game that was designed to be inhabited by a community. You complete all the hard work that these guys put into building those worlds. Thank you for being our heroes. Thank you for being our community. It's been great to be here with you. Enjoy the rest of the show. See you at four.